Thank you, Lord, for another day of life you've given us in your only begotten Son. Thank you for the Holy Spirit's ministry and the unselfish ministry of your holy angels. We invite all of your presence here to be with us this day. Direct our hearts into your truth, which is Jesus. It's your forgiveness for our sins, our shortcomings, things that we think of and say and do that are dishonoring to you. We pray you'll please forgive each and every one. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Direct your Holy Spirit to you. Give Brother Brian your words for us today. We're thinking of things that affect us corporately. We need so much to return to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And here on the borders of Kadesh Barnea again, so much need the fullness of the Spirit to finish the work in our lives and finish the work in the world, and that we can go into the heavenly kingdom. Think of our brothers in prison, be a blessing for them, and for the Pathfinder weekend, you'll bless them all with. Uh, safety, that they'll have a wonderful experience with you, Rob Rose. Want to uplift our evangelism efforts and ask your guidance and blessing for that. And Father, we lift up the Afghanistan believers, those that are left over there that need to come out of there. We pray you provide them a way to make that happen. I think also of our medical institutions. We see what's going on with these vaccine mandates, and we pray that we would be resistant to all of that in a Christ-like way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's several um, individual requests, you know, each and every one, Larry and Linda, and uh, sure the sister Mary, and each of us have uh, troubles and problems and praises in our hearts. And we know you can meet each and every one. We pray you'll answer them all according to your will. And thank you for hearing our prayer for we ask it in Jesus' name. Here I pray. Revelation 14, verse 7. Everybody there with me? So here on page or two. Let's read it together. Saying with a loud voice, Dear God, we give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea on the top of the waters. Amen. In times like these, you need a savior. In times like these, you need a neighbor. Be very sure. Thank you. 
May we please bow our heads. Gracious Father, we have a special request to you this morning. Father, it is undoubtedly that we are in the last days. We know you're soon to come. We believe your message is going forward around the world. You've chosen your instruments and whom you're going to use to proclaim this. And I pray that as we share your truth, that your sheep that are out there may hear your voice mm -hmm. and that they may follow. This morning, we expect great things from you. Lord, we're not concerned with numbers. We never are. But we're concerned, Lord, with your name being glorified and your word being exalted. Give us the strength we need at this time to comprehend and understand what you require of us. And we may bring our lives as individuals into harmony with your divine will. We ask this in the precious name and the authority of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. Uh, we're going to open our Bibles up to John chapter 16. And we're going to look at a mighty promise. Can everyone hear me on this pretty well? Yeah. Is the mic on? Mm -hmm. Yes. John chapter 16 is a promise for us. And while we're uh, looking at this promise, perhaps we have the uh, slide changer. John chapter 16. I want us to key in on verse 13. I always go to this because I don't believe that it's possible in human effort alone, unaided by divine strength, for us to comprehend and understand what God is trying to convey to his church. So in John 16, 13, there's a mighty promise that's for every one of us. Okay, thank you, for all of us. And notice what it says. How be it when he Notice he's referred to as the he. That's important, right? How be it when he, the spirit of what? The spirit of truth. Never ever allow yourself to disconnect the spirit of God from the truth. They always run together. You'll never see a separation between the two. It says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he's going to do something for us this morning. He's going to do what? Into some truth, right? All truth. No, he's going to guide us into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he what? Speak, and he will show us things to come. What are things to come? What's a good word for that? Here's the As Bible students, prophecy. prophecy. 
The things to come are things that are going to transpire or happen. So the author behind prophecy is the Holy Spirit. And the one that makes the truth effectual is the gift that's been given to us. And it's called the spirit of truth. Did we see that? Did we believe that today? Dear Father, we pray for the Holy Spirit, Lord, in our hearts. We need him at this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. We left off last week from slide 14. And we wanted to look. I think we were right there already. We wanted to look at the everlasting gospel. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 14, and we're going to look at verse 7. Now, we're familiar with this, but what we want to do is we want to become so acquainted with what God is trying to tell us that we need not doubt nor question exactly who he's leading and the people in whom he's leading, the message in which they have been entrusted to proclaim. Our convictions deepen as we personally assimilate the word to our life and we obey it and carry it out and when we share it with others. Uh, it says here in Revelation 14, 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his what? <laughs> is come and worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. You know, this first message is not disconnected from the everlasting gospel. As a matter of fact, as we look in verse 6, you'll see that the messenger or the angel that's flying in the midst of heaven, he, he, he possesses this everlasting gospel, and it's to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And the very first word of verse 7 tells us what this gospel entails. Say with a loud voice. Fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment has come. So we see that the judgment hour message is connected with the everlasting gospel. Why is that imperative and important at this time? What's the most attacked fundamental teaching that God used the Adventist church to bring to the world right now? What is being undermined within our church? Which message? Does anyone know? Some of you are familiar that have been around a long time. You know that it started during your youth, and now we see a climax in here in 2021. Sanctuary message. The sanctuary message dealing with the investigative judgment. Mm -hmm. It is unbiblical. It's not doctrinal. It's something conjured up by the Adventist church with some false prophet named Ellen White. Isn't that what we're told? Isn't that the attack that Satan tries to bring to us? Everything that can be thrown at the remnant has been done. We have internal conflicts that seeks to exalt itself above the will of God. And then we have external forces trying to undermine our faith in the message for this time. Every single person in here falls in that category. It doesn't matter if you're white, black, Hispanic, or whatever you may be, the conflict is within the mind of man. Amen? That puts us all on common ground. Now notice here, as we continue. Now, it says, fear God and give glory to him. Has anyone ever wondered how do we give glory to God and fear him? You know, there's a lot of things to fear right now, right? But I'll tell you this. If you fear God, you won't be fearing COVID and all of these different things that are coming upon the earth. It says, because of the things that are coming upon the earth, the man's heart will be full of fear. Everything but the fear of God. Notice here, if we turn to Romans chapter 3, and we key in on verse 23, the Bible is going to begin to give us somewhat of an understanding of what it means to fear God. Romans chapter 3, and we want to key in on verse 23. Romans 3. Everybody there? Now notice this. It says, for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. There's roughly 15 or 20 people in here, right? Do you realize that the Bible has told us that all have sinned and came short of what? The glory of God. But the message of the everlasting gospel is to fear God and give him glory. How do we overcome that dilemma when all have already sinned and come short of that glory? Now notice here. We're going to go to Exodus chapter 33, 18. We're going to look a little closer at what this glory is referring to. Exodus chapter 33. And let's look at Moses, a man that had the privilege of being directly in the presence of God. Of course, he was hid in Christ. 
But if you look here in Exodus chapter 33, and we look at verse 18, notice what the Bible teaches regarding how to give God glory. Everyone there? It says, starting in 18, and we're going to look at verses uh, 19 as well, or verse 19. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy what? Mm -hmm. So Moses is asking a request from the Father. And he says, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will do what? Show mercy. So notice, God is getting ready to show Moses his glory. God's glory is directly connected with his name based on, based on verse 19. And this name we see is in his wonderful character. Now I'm going to show you something. Look at verse 34, or chapter 34. And we're going to show, as we continue to look at this, in reference to his glory being shown to Moses. I believe it's Exodus 34, and we're going to key in on verse 5. <laughs> Amen. There you go. He's fast. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Because we know that name is connected with glory based on Exodus uh, 33, 7. He says, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, or Yehovah, Yehovah, Elohim, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and what? Truth. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving the iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the what? Guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. If we have to sum up what was just shown to Moses or proclaimed to him in verse 6 or 7, what can we uh, conclude behind the glory that's connected with this name that was proclaimed to Moses? What can we say this glory is? What is it dealing with? What did God go out of the way to do? Show him his character. Show him his character. The last work we're told on earth, in reference to the three angels' message, is that God, uh, it would be a revelation of God's what? Character to the world. Not only would it be a, a message proclaimed, it will be one lived out and mm -hmm. demonstrated. Isn't that powerful in a high privilege? So as the people of God are embracing the first angel's message, it's going to prepare them at the climax of the third angel's message in order to live out a message that reveals the very character of God. We're told that the image of Jesus will be perfectly reproduced in his people prior to him coming back. I have a question. Who was Jesus' intercessor when he was here on earth as man? He had none. Why? Jesus is the high privilege that, uh, uh, or the goal for all of us to obtain at the end of time, those that will possess the seal of God will reflect that very image completely. Jesus had no intercessor because he had no sin. The remnant who are sealed, the 144,000 who reflect his image, will have their sins blotted out. Therefore, they need no intercessor between them and the Father. All of heaven is escorting the, uh, the Father and the Son to pick us up. But he's coming to a people that have been redeemed from all iniquity and whose sins have been blotted out because the atonement has been complete. When he comes back, they reflect the image of his son so fully that now they can stand in the full presence of the Father. When it talks about giving glory to God, this is the promise and the work of grace that God is going to do for his people prior to him coming. It's an act of mercy as we cooperate with our divine high priest. Now notice this as we continue. It says here, in Revelation 14, 1 through 5, you say, where do you get that from, Brian? Turn to Revelation 14. Now, you notice, in Revelation 14, this is something interesting. We, we were done a, a huge favor by simplifying the Bible and putting it in chapters and numbers and verses. It made it easier for us. Originally, it was written in lines on scroll paper, right? From right to left, just a bunch of lines. Can you imagine having to read that way? So Revelation 14, 1 through 5 is actually a continuation of chapter 13. After the mark of the beast and the image of the beast is presented and imposed upon the inhabitants of the earth, when they get victory over that system that's in place to oppress God's people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, look at the end product 
of these particular individuals that are standing when all this is finished. In Revelation 14, 1 through 5, notice what it says. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood where? And with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having the Father's name written where? Name is connected with his glory, and his glory is his character. Do you see that? So they have the character of God reproduced and is in their forehead. Have you ever paid attention to why the new covenant in Hebrews chapter 8 and 9 says specifically that I will write my laws in their heart and their minds? And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. The completion of the new covenant is depicted in Revelation chapter 14, 1 through 5. The character of God, the law of God as a transcript of his character is reproduced and written in his people. That is why Sabbath keepers are the forerunners in demonstrating this work because the law has not been changed. Only the man of sin and the prince of darkness has sought to remove the heart from this, uh, the law from the soul temple where God wants to put it in every human being on this planet. And notice here, it says in, uh, in verse uh, two, and I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne. Keep that in mind, before the throne. And before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from where? These are they which were not defiled with women. We know from scripture, according to Revelation 12, 1, and 17, 1 through 3, that a woman in prophecy is a depiction of what? The church. These that are redeemed from the earth who has the, have the Father's character written in their forehead where the new covenant has been complete, they are not defiled with churches. But we're going to find which church that they're not defiled with. Because Satan, before it's all said and done, is working instrumentally through the churches that are connected with the state in order to impose the mark. We're told that the image of the beast, which is the union of church and state, is the test for seven-day Adventists, and we're going to see it transpiring right before our eyes. It's in development right now. Notice, they are not defiled with these apostate state churches. It says, for they are what? Virgins. If you go to Matthew chapter 25, we won't turn there now. You want to find it. They are depicted as the five wise virgins. The five foolish virgins are the other women that are defiling the inhabitants of the earth and causing them to be intoxicated. Now notice here as we continue, it says, for they are not defiled with women. And it says uh, uh, in verse four, these are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he does what? Going. These were redeemed from among men being the first, first fruits unto God and to the lamb. Verse five is key. And in their mouth was found, found no guile, which means deception or lies. Why? For they are without fault before where? The throne of God. Why do you think it's significant that they are without fault before the throne? Where is the throne of God located at this particular time where the image and the mark of the beast has been posed after these things have transpired? Where is the throne of God? Turn to Revelation 11, chapter 19. We're going to see something very interesting. The high priest, mm -hmm. the final work that he accomplishes on our behalf is found in the Holy of Holies. Jesus is our high priest has went there before the throne where the mercy seat is at. His blood now has been applied to the mercy seat. We know that. That blood cancels out the sins of the penitent who have came to him with a repentant heart and turned away from their sins. They have repented and been converted by the power of God. Therefore, the law, which is a transcript of his character, which is contained within the Ark of the Covenant that sits right below the throne of God, we're going to find the demands of that law that requires the death of the sinner is met by the blood of Jesus. That's why the Bible in the book of Revelation says they overcame him by the what? The blood of the Lamb. We can't overcome anything not even the own, thing, or the own things within us that annoy us to death. We can't overcome anything without the blood of Jesus Christ. He's our substitute 
as well as our example. And as Adventists, we often fall into the trap of so much focusing on him as our example that we've never had the foundation of him being our substitute. See, the substitute sets the foundation so that we can build upon it, not wood, hay, and stubble, but gold tried in the fire. God wants us to have an experience that where we embrace the substitutionary atonement of Jesus, which simply means one who is perfect, undefiled by sinners, came, lived a perfect life, met the demands of the law, stretched out his arms and bled on you and my behalf and said it is finished. He did that in exchange for your filthiness. Every single crime and transgression and perverted way that you've committed or me, God has pardoned by his blood as we exercise faith in it. No one is beyond the scope and reach of his redeeming grace. Amen. We must believe and embrace that. That's why Satan attempts. Let, let me take you, turn, turn to Revelation 12 and notice, look here. And I, I, I love this text because it brings hope. In verse uh, 10, notice what it says in verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God, where? Day and night. Who's the accuser of the brethren? Where did he once occupy a position? So if he's cast down, who is the accuser of the brethren, who's left in heaven? The Father, the Son, Holy Spirit who's everywhere. The angels who never broke one commandment are there. And those that were redeemed as the first fruits when the graves were opened on crucifixion day during Passover, when the graves were opened and taken to the Holy City. Those are the people that occupy heaven. So accusations with the intent to destroy and judge a person to hell do not come from anyone in heaven. Who do they come from? So when someone tells you you went too far and you're lost and that voice is loud in your head, it does not come from Jesus Christ. The accuser of our brethren is cast down. Jesus still intercedes in the Holy of Holies and he's more than willing to pardon the sinner who comes to him with a heart of confession and repentance. We have to believe and understand this at this time because Satan is going to come to us personally. Everybody must stand on the written word of Jesus Christ. In the wilderness, we see an example of how Christ was able to overcome. His word of the word of God was hidden where? In his heart that he would not sin against the Father. Christ promises to dwell in the soul temple so that you and I can have victory over all of it. Do we believe that? It's a message that's been watered down, downplayed, and bastardized in this church and abroad. Because the Protestants have rejected the key and the remedy in order to see God in his full glory. And notice this, as we continue here. They were not fought before the throne. And notice here. Colossians 1.27 is another powerful text. And it's another witness to what we're conveying today. I'm going to look at the book of Colossians. It's actually written up here. It says, first, how do we give him glory when we all fall short? We're answering that question. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the what? Mm -hmm. The hope of glory. You know, the Gentiles were lost people, weren't they? Alienated from the promises of God. But God is showing that when he dwells in the heart of man, this divine mystery, it is the actual hope of glory. So if the message is going forward, fear God and give glory to him, the remedy or the solution, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, is to receive Christ in the heart so that the hope of glory can now be our ambition and our desire. We can exercise faith to realize that Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith, will carry out what he's promised in the heart of you and I. Mm -hmm. Every man's been given a measure of what? Where should we place it? On ourselves? Mm -hmm. We look only within long enough to identify our error, and then we look above to him who is able to fix it. Mm -hmm. The Ethiopian cannot change his skin, neither can the leper change his spots. We can choose to obey God, but the work of transforming the heart is a work that belongs to God. That's why God blesses those that obey him. 
We will do what he says. God will change the inclinations and the propensities and the desires. Doesn't he promise that in his word? Notice here in John 17, 1. We're going to see the connection here, Colossians 1, 27, but notice in John chapter 17, verse 1, what the Bible teaches. John 17. We're going to hear in verse 1. It says in John 17, 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes where? To heaven. I told you that's the key where we need to look. And said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may what? Glorify thee. The only way possible for us to glorify the Father is for him first to glorify us. Can you see that? It destroys self-righteousness. It destroys me trying to obey a set of external rules in order to appease an angry God. It's the work of grace in the heart by the power of God, by believing his promises and walking in obedience. Now notice this as we continue here. That's the way we obtain the glory of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it also brings this out. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are what? Not your own. The whole illustration of the sanctuary in the old covenant was a figure and symbol. Those things did transpire. They were sacrificing animals, but I can guarantee you, I don't care if they killed a million goats, it could never remove sins as it pertains to the conscience. But the work of our high priest who has better sacrifices than those, he will remove sin from the conscience where there can be no more remembrance. In the great controversy, we're told when Michael finishes his work of interceding on our behalf, when he stands up, she says, we're going to try to recall a particular sin, but somehow we can't bring them to mind. Why? Glory, because they've been blotted out by Jesus Christ. We can no longer bring them to remembrance. There's no longer the defilement of the sin that causes us to approach to God with a guilty, violated conscience. The shame of our nakedness does not appear. Isn't that a mighty promise for you and I? These things we are to believe, we are to, we, we are to meditate upon, and, and we're in prayer, ask God for this experience. Notice here in Hosea chapter 6, verse 3, this is how God promises to come. Then shall we know, if we fall along to know the Lord, this is before his physical coming, his going forth is prepared as the morning. He shall come to us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. When the divine seed, which is the word of God, has been planted in the heart, it only needs to be watered. Jesus promises, I'm going to come as the rain. When we receive the rain, notice what it does. It waters the seed. When you water a seed, what does it do? It brings forth first the bud, then the ear, then the corn. Notice that's the fruit. So the fruit of the spirit, according to the book of Galatians, will be manifested in those who hide the word of God in their heart, which is the seed, and receive the rain. Then, when that rain bears fruit, when God sees the fruit of the Spirit, he then promises, I'm going to send the latter rain also as a gift, and it's going to bring the fruit to maturity or, or perfection. That's so that they can now be harvested. Because remember, the fruit cannot be harvested until it comes to maturity. The only thing that can bring it to maturity is the latter rain, but the fruit must be there. <laughs> Do we understand that? This destroys the idea and the false understanding also that we somehow have to be perfect in order to receive the latter rain. We can't have iniquity in the heart and we must be converted and we must have repented from all known sins. But the type of perfection that's going to cause us to stand without an intercessor is the reproduction of Jesus in the character. Where then Jesus can stand up and he now can move out the way and we are we're able to stand in the presence of the Father. What is interesting about the latter and former rain? Can any of us cause it to rain? No. no. Just like we can't cause the sun to shine. The shining of the sun, the rain and the seed all proceed from God as gifts. The word is here as a gift. Now, what we do with it is another question. In order to produce a desire in the heart for rain, you must see your thirstiness. The Bible says, blessed are they that thirst after what? Righteousness. God is going to come, and he comes as the former and the latter rain. And then notice what James 5, 7, so we can understand what the husband is waiting for. 
It says here, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. We need patience. That's why in Revelation 12, 14, after the three angels' messages have been given, here are they that keep the commandments of God. Here are the patience of the saints. They've endured after giving this message because they've been ridiculed and pronounced as the scum of the earth. Mm -hmm. The dragon is going to have a special attention against you and I as we share this with those that are sheep. Now notice here, it says, unto the coming of the Lord, behold the husbandman waiter for what? The precious fruit of the earth and have long patience for it until we receive the early and the latter rain. Jesus is the husband. He's given the rain. Now he's waiting for the precious fruit to, to, to bring, come forth after he gives that rain. We're going to find in Revelation 14 that this man with a sharp sickle is coming to gather some grapes. Amen? And I'm telling you, we want to make sure that we have the fruit of the Spirit when Christ comes and that it's brought to maturity. Romans 8, 9. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And here it goes. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He don't belong to Christ. There's a few of us in here, here today. Before this message is over, it would be at the peril of your own soul to leave and not make sure that you at least at the minimum have the Holy Ghost. Do you not know that that's the key to all our woes? No one should leave out of a message like this without making sure that their hearts have received the Holy Spirit. Some people are waiting on to get themselves to a, a certain state of holiness or to correct this and that in their life. All that is, is like Pastor said a couple of weeks ago, is behavior modification. It'll never stand the test of judgment. Before you leave here, we're going to have special prayer. And I'm telling you, anybody that does not have the Holy Spirit, you will leave here with you. It don't mean you're going to be jumping up and speaking in gibberish languages. It means by faith, you have heard the word, you believed it because it's entered into your heart and you receive it. God then honors you. He honors your choice. I'm going to give you a text. And I've said it, said it before. If you and me, some of you are, have children, if we, being evil, evil, natural, know how to give good gifts unto our children, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that beg, to them that cut themselves and, and mutilate their bodies or to go on long pilgrimages, to them that ask for it, to them that ask. You receive not because you what? Ask not. And when you ask, you ask in a mist that you may use it and consume it upon your own lust. When the heart is open and lowered, the only reason we want the Holy Ghost is because we want to be lifted above our, uh, above our vile ways and make sure that we're not in opposition to you because the carnal heart is an enemy against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It's impossible to stand without fault before the throne when the heart is carnal, sold under sin. Notice here in Acts chapter 5, 32. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that right. obey him. It's that simple. Notice here. Why must we fear God and be glory in God? The word hour takes in time. In the case of the judgment, a specific time is brought to view. As we read the text below, remember that the remnant of the woman keep his commandments and have the gift of prophecy at the end of time. Solomon puts it this way. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, that word translate mankind. Notice here. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Here it is in time. On the day of atonement, all known sin were to be confessed and forsaken in order for them to be what? Counseled out by the high priest. The Lord tells us how this is possible. You know, when we look at Jesus and we look at the mighty works he did when he was here on earth, one of the most overlooked attributes about Jesus Christ was, he said, I, look, I come not to judge man. He said, I came that man might have life and he may have it more abundantly. It is Satan that has convinced mankind that Jesus has come to deprive you of happiness. Am I, am I right about that? Don't most people think that, the, that when you serve God is some dry and just a bunch of this and don't do that and that and that God doesn't want us to be happy. The Bible does not teach that. You know that true happiness is found in freedom from sin. 
The peace that surpasses all understanding are not found in the fountains of this world. They only come from the throne of Emmanuel. I'll tell you this, when we drink of that fountain, we'll never thirst again. The Bible tells us that. Sorrow may try to creep its ugly face in the midst of us. The clouds of darkness may try to overshadow the sun of righteousness, but I guarantee you, if you just look a little higher, beyond every dark cloud, the sun still shines brightly. Christ has not moved. He said, I'll never leave nor forsake you. He said, Lord, I'm with you always, even unto the end. That's the promise for you and I. Notice here as we continue. Worship the true God, and we're going to close on this point. Worship him that made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. And this is the first thing he was message, in the fountains of waters. Notice Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of it. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and did what? Sanctified it, because it ended, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. The creation week ending with the seven day Sabbath is the crowning act of God and distinguishes him from all the false gods. It is a sign for you and me. It is a sign for his people. We can identify the people of God when they've had this experience. They have the Holy Ghost and they keep his seal, the Sabbath. Turn to Mark 2 for a moment as we bring things to a close. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. I'll tell you this, the gospel has not lost its power. Man, because of iniquity, it has separated us from God. Our ability to see and hear correctly has been marred. Notice in Mark chapter 2, and we're going to look here first, in verses 26 and 27. Everyone there? Okay, it says here, we'll start in 27. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man. Again, that word translates mankind. And not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Now, we're at a climax now, where we have Sunday that's been exalted, which is an institution of the papacy, and the Protestant state churches have embraced it. And we have God's seal, which is the Sabbath, according to Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12, and Exodus chapter 31. And remember, the creation Sabbath, which we are told to remember in the Ten Commandments that was given to Moses, preceded any covenants, any black or white people, any Asians, or other, any other race. It was simply Adam and Eve. And God said it was good. He blessed man with the Sabbath, and he blessed man with the marriage institution of the Garden of Eden. So we're going to find here that the Sabbath has always been a distinguishing mark that separated his people from the pagans. And if we embrace God's law, we're going to find that special privileges and blessings are pronounced upon those who keep his seal. He's going to take his seal, and this is what's so beautiful in Ezekiel, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and I give you my word, this is the last uh, few texts. I'm going to show you how the Sabbath seal uh, is placed within the heart. This is the process whereby God does that. Because a person may ask, well, does that mean that everybody that observes the seventh day and doesn't know it work, they're going to be in the kingdom? No, the Bible doesn't teach that. I'm going to show you something in uh, Ezekiel chapter 1. Notice for, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I'll let you get there. Now let's look at verse 13. It says, In whom you also trusted, that after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and who also after that ye believed, you were sealed with what? That Holy Spirit of promise. Watch this. Which is the earnest, that means the down payment of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Many of you are with the closing that are purchased homes. Prior to you obtaining that home, you give them a deposit, which is called earnest money. They hold that money, guaranteeing that you're going to show up for that contract and then it's going to close the deal. The Holy Spirit is given as a down payment or earnest money so that when Jesus comes, he can redeem that which contains, which the uh, our earnest money in the covenant where the agreement is made there. Now, I'm going to share this with you. It says the Holy Spirit was sealed unto the day of our what? Redemption. 
If the Sabbath is the seal, how is it that the Bible teaches that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the means whereby we are sealed. Because the Holy Spirit does something for us based on the promise we read earlier in John chapter 16, verse 13. The Spirit of truth leads and guides us into what? All truth. What is true? John 17, 17. Thy word is true. But what else is true? Psalm 119, verses 151. All thy commandments are true. In Isaiah chapter 8, the Bible says, seal the law among my disciples. So when we receive the Holy Ghost as our earnest, as our down payment, the job of the Holy Ghost then is to lead and guide us into the Word of God. Within the Word of God, we find the law of God. And within the law of God, we find the Sabbath commandment. Everybody who has the Holy Ghost will not be in opposition to God's law, specifically the Sabbath commandment. So when we receive the Holy Ghost, if we have the Holy Spirit, it is guaranteed as we continue in the faith, we will be sealed with the Sabbath. The Bible, the, uh, the Holy Ghost will write God's law in our hearts and in our minds, and then the new covenant will be complete in you and I. What I want to do is I want to take a moment, and I want to answer some questions. It's very important. If we have any questions regarding this subject or even last week, we want to take a few moments and address them. There are certain persons that still need to make a decision to make sure that they have the Holy Spirit. Please do not leave here without knowing for a fact. You know, if you ask people do they have the Holy Ghost, you'll be surprised at how many different answers you'll get. Only you, in your own mind and heart, know if you have the Holy Spirit. You know if you belong to Jesus. This is not a profession. You didn't join the Adventist church because you thought intellectually it was the right thing to do. You did it because you were pricked and you were convicted and you yielded yourself to God to be used by him. He then chose you. The Bible says we have not chosen God, but he's chosen us for such a time as this. Any questions regarding how this works, the simplicity of this message, the gospel, or anything that we've covered so far, now is the right time to ask. Are there any questions? Is there, and while you're thinking of your questions, is there anybody here that have not made their connection with God sure by making sure that they have the Holy Spirit? It's nothing to be ashamed of. When the Holy Spirit dwells in the heart, you'll know it. The things you once hated, you now love. The things you once loved, you will hate. The Bible tells us that. And you know, we always use the illustration of uh, our, our, our health reform as an example. You know, prior to coming to God, perhaps our taste buds were perverted. We ate everything that tasted good to us. And they tried to introduce this old strange tofu and broccoli. They had the weirdest taste to us. But God was able then to change the taste buds to where we begin to love the tofu. We love the broccoli. We love the green drinks and the smoothies, right? God, the same way that he can do the physical, he can do the spiritual. Mm -hmm. Those things that pull us, those propensities and bents toward evil that we love to do when we get entangled in evil when we leave church sometimes. Those things that we do when the doors are shut and no one's there. Do you realize that God can change those propensities and inclinations? We need not retain one propensity to sin, the Bible says. He will change the desires. He will actually sanctify the emotions to where they're stable. Who has not received the Holy Spirit and needs special prayer to receive it at this time? We must make sure we have the Holy Ghost. That's the appeal. It doesn't matter how young or how old. God doesn't discriminate. He's in the business of saving souls today. Mm -hmm. Is anybody that's not made a decision for Jesus that wants that experience? They want to make sure. Maybe you're uncertain. You don't know yet. You're still battling whether or not, hey, do I belong to God? We should know we belong to God because when the Holy Spirit dwells in us, the first thing he starts to do is give us a burden to share our experience with other people. We will take what God has done for us, and then we have this desire that's almost uncontrollable for us to go out and then proclaim the news that he's given to us personally. Perhaps you've given your heart to Christ once before. You've been baptized. But for some reason, I don't know, because of wicked men, because of your own iniquities or bad choices, you've grown cold. And you see that that fire is not there anymore that you once had. You become critical. Perhaps you are a good, polished Adventist, but you're not a converted man of God. The Lord has an appeal for those as well. 
telling you he wants to take possession of the whole heart. This silly work is going on. These people have lost their mind. This COVID stuff, this Black Lives Matter stuff, this mandates and, and um, my, my patience is wearing thin speeches by people who are supposed to be sophisticated. Do you know that the Jewish, the, uh, uh, um, the uh, Nazi people were intellectual people, very educated? The Lord permitted those things to happen. God is showing us that it doesn't matter the mental attainments of men and women, how refined they are, sophisticated, they'll resort to the most debasing practices of genocide if left to themselves. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's going to put us on the side of Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, is that we're born from above. The mind of Christ is the only thing that does not resort to the lower things of this earth. The reason why homosexuality is so rampant right now, as God's spirit is withdrawn, you'll find that even sexual orientation becomes confused. Mm -hmm. Romans 1 teaches that. It's just the signs of the time. The Lord said, my spirit will not always strive with me. Y'all remember those words, right? During the times of Noah. Even when you don't belong to God, do you know that it's the moving of the Holy Ghost that causes a person not to carry out certain deeds? The Spirit is a restrainer. Whenever it was on Pharaoh, he can lie. Now, I'm going to tell you this. His will wasn't on the side of God, but God was able to move and soften. But you know what? He cannot change the bent will of Pharaoh. It was impossible. The only reason Lucifer was not reinstated with heaven is because his sin became incurable. You could put a restraint on the wicked, but that will rise back again at the end of days when Christ comes back after the thousand years and the holy city descends. Satan bows down to the kingdom of Lord, and he pronounces thou art just and holy. But do you know after that moment that he comes up again and all that wickedness and that anger comes back again and he thinks he can take the city? He encroaches upon a holy God when the Bible says that God is a consuming fire mm -hmm. and rain comes down from heaven. It is an act of mercy that we have not been in the presence of God because sin in the presence of God, the same fire that removes it out of the heart when we cooperate is the same fire that destroys the sinner when it comes in the presence of God. It's the same fire. There's no difference. Is there anybody that wants to make a decision for Christ that is not sure that they belong to him at this time? Or is there anybody that wants to reconsecrate themselves to the Lord at this time so they got special prayer? My sister right there. Mm -hmm. If the elder can come up, we'll have special prayer with those that are raised their hand. Mm -hmm. Because God honors those that honor him. He said, if you're ashamed of me, I'm mm -hmm. going to be ashamed of you. Mm -hmm. It's not manipulation. It's a truth. Angels record when decisions are like that are made and they're stamped in glory. God does not lie. Is there anyone else that wants to give their heart to Christ or make a decision to reconsecrate themselves to Jesus at this time? Sister, mm -hmm. let's pray. Let's have special prayer. And those that are already belong to God, we're going we're gonna to kneel and we're going to pray for those that have made a decision. Heaven records these things. Jessica, sis, Rain, Rain, okay, and my brother, Steve, Steve, Rain, and Jessica. Oh, can you pray for us? Heavenly Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, and we present our hearts to you. We can't give them. We, we can only ask you to take them from us. We may have had experiences where we there have been hearts in the past and fallen away. It seemed that the troubles times are ahead for us. Mm -hmm. We can't make it on our own. We want to live inside of us. Show yourselves out of us to others, Lord. At this moment, we want to we consecrate our hearts mm -hmm. to you and ask that you will continue to open up our spiritual eyesight that we may see. Your beautiful character more clearly, more clearly until that day when you return for us, because we perfectly reflect your image. Mm -hmm. May you use each one of us in this work that we need to do. At least in that day, we pray in Jesus' name. Dear Father, we say a thank you. Dear Father, we say a special prayer for Jessica, Lord. I don't know her, Lord, but you do. And Father, we know your word, and that it applies to all of us. As she's made a decision either to give her heart to you or to reconsecrate herself, Lord. I pray that you would honor her choice. Mm -hmm. I know your word says in all of heaven rejoices at this moment they've written this down. Mm -hmm. It stands on the record books. 
Father, give her the Holy Spirit and fill her heart. Remind her of your love for her whenever the enemy comes in like a flood. Lord, you said the Spirit of God will come stand in the midst of her. May this promise, Lord, be hers and then she claim. And may the church brethren here nourish her and strengthen her. I ask this in your name. Amen. Lord, also say a special prayer for rain. rain. And I ask that you would be with her as well. Father, continue to protect her and guide her. Watch over her, Lord, and strengthen her mind and fortify her against the enemy. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray that if this is her decision for you, Lord, we consecration to you, Lord. Empower her and give her strength. Mm -hmm. You know her heart and her desires, Lord, and answer her according to your will. Mm -hmm. and Lord, I pray for Steve as well. Mm -hmm. This is new family members that I've never met. The Lord, you know them from eternity, even before they were formed in the womb. Mm -hmm. And I pray that you would keep him and bless him by the mm -hmm. power of your word. Strengthen mm -hmm. his mind, Lord. And relight that fire that's went out, Lord. Mm -hmm. May he give his heart entirely to you mm -hmm. as he seeks to close up this word. Lord, you said, Lord, that those that belong to you, you will write your name on our hearts and minds, and you will take us with you when you come back. Mm -hmm. You prepared a place for us, Lord, in your father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, you would have told us. Mm -hmm. But we know when you come back, you will take us where you are. Mm -hmm. These three that have come forward, I pray, Lord, that they would, uh, as they give their heart to you, that you would honor your word. To the blessing, strength in Jesus' name, amen. As we get ready to dismiss and go forward, we'll just uh, pronounce the benediction. We'll bow our heads, we'll say a general prayer. Father, thank you so much. Lord, we are unworthy. Unworthy of the salvation that you've blessed us with. But Lord, we trust in you, Lord. I know myself, Lord, I have no righteousness in which to commend myself to you. But Lord, we thank you for this privilege and honor. And I thank you, Lord, for your word and your message. Now be with everyone and bless them as they leave. Lord, keep their thoughts upon you and upon the sacredness of the Sabbath. We love you. We ask that you will continue to visit us. But more importantly, Lord, join us. In Jesus' name.